Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to the Gender Libertarian Podcast. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Libertarian Institute, and I do also now have a Patreon page where you can get early access to my podcast episodes. You can find me on Patreon under Jen Monroe, or I will put the link in the show notes. So for this episode, I'm talking to Nancy Rommelman again, and just as a brief side note, this is kind of a part two to an episode that I recorded earlier this year, so I will go ahead and put a link in the show notes to the first podcast episode that I did with Nancy, so that you can kind of know the backstory of kind of how we got here and what Nancy's story is, and so you can kind of better understand what we're talking about in this episode, so I will put the links in the show notes, and I will also re-promote it, but... I sit down with Nancy again to talk to her about how life has been since being canceled and how things have changed and kind of a wide ranging conversation about a whole bunch of stuff related to cancel culture and people who have been canceled and kind of the effects of it and how you can survive it. But it's not always the case for everybody. So, yeah. This is kind of a wide-ranging conversation, like I said, so I hope you guys do enjoy it. So without too much further ado, here's my conversation with Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Jen. How are you doing? I'm good. Here in New York City, baby. Awesome. Well, I guess that is a good a segue as any to explain to people, how's life been treating you since the last podcast? There's been a lot of changes in your life. There have been a lot of changes. Um, Life is pretty great. Um... Uh, even before the last time we spoke, which I think was in March, um, after the sort of whole uh, Ristretto Roasters, hashtag me neither, imbroglio, I had already been planning to relocate or at least part-time to New York City where I'm from. So that was already in my mind and I'd been spending a couple of months a year here for the past couple of years and I decided in January I was coming and then everything hit in Portland. So I stayed around there for a bit longer. But um, in August, I got in my car and I drove here. And I'm I'm here most of the time. But I do go back and forth to Portland. I'll go back in November for a little bit. But yeah, here I am. Liking it. Cool. I'm, I'm happy yeah. for you. I, I wish I could move to New York too. But unfortunately, I am a poor. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, looked, I looked at apartment prices the other day. I was like, oh, yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. Yeah. But... <laughs> I got to say, I'm actually, I mean, I, I'm a little bit jaded, but they're actually not as bad as I anticipated. Um, I was figuring, man, you're going to look at 3500 a month, but you can get, you can get something for about two twenty five. I've got a couple in that look. range. Yeah. So, so. Well, you are uh, still at least amongst the living, even though you were technically canceled. But Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> You're still here, though, and it's been kind of okay. I mean, not entirely, but kind of okay-ish, yeah. sort of, kind of. I have to say, um, I would imagine that a lot of this canceling, for lack of a better word, is the term we use these days, um, some of it is going to be up to you. You know, um, you you saw with the, uh, you know, young adult lit stuff, um, people uh were you know canceled you know the the masses came after them and some of them were, were well one guy i'm thinking of in particular he returned his his book contract money and basically you know went into exile um i i hey if that's what he wants to do you know he'd also sort of been part previously of the of the canceling um mob or pack so maybe he wants to live and die by that sort of um that sort of way of operating i just don't i i don't want to cancel people and i don't uh accept that i would be canceled so i'm just not that said and i as we've talked about a bit and people probably can read about it if they want to have written enough about it it was much tougher on my husband because they had an actual physical target that they could um sort of have a financial impact on and and it has been rougher for him for sure he's also not in the media so he's you know, he doesn't like all this stuff. He doesn't pay attention to it. Um, I certainly didn't like being piled on, but I also knew it really didn't have that much to do with me. And I think that it was just another, you know, it was the next thing for all of us to hate today. And next week they're going to be onto something else, which I, I suppose they are because I don't get any more hate mail. Um, or, you know, you know, don't read her or whatever. And I've carried on and work is great. So, there you go. And I think that is a, a thing that a lot of people don't think about. And it's kind of like you, you've landed on your feet, obviously, but 
one of the problems I have with cancel culture is when you cancel someone, like you do this, like, and then the people that do it, they go on with their lives. They don't even think about it anymore, but it still affects the people that got canceled for ages and ages and ages after everyone else has already moved on. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about is like, it does, even, even if you do land on your feet, it does still have like long-term impacts on your life and on the decisions you make post cancelization, basically. And, and I want to uh, really, really super qualify what I was saying. You know, what happened to me was pretty, pretty light. Um, th- there are people who, uh, they're, you know, they effectively feel that their careers are over. And in fact, their careers in many ways are over. I'm thinking of, um, of, uh, okay, so now the name, oh, Jonathan Kamen, who, you know, Emily Yoff did a great piece uh, on him in Reason yeah. uh, about a month and a half ago. You know, he he probably um, actually will not be working in journalism. And actually, I, I've spoken with him, I've spoken with his girlfriend, and, and he has an interesting new trajectory that he's going on, which I won't give the details on, but it's, it's, they're not mine to give. But he made the decision, like, you're, you're, you're not, I don't know if people that are doing the canceling want you to go into exile forever. I mean, maybe a few people do, but in fact, what you were just saying, Jen, that they don't really think about it, but of course they don't because they don't really put any effort into it. I mean, what kind of effort does it take to hit a like or a not like? I mean, it's nothing. So they don't feel responsible because they didn't really do anything, right? I mean, they did when it's 100,000 of them. But, you know, they're not thinking about what they did to someone because, in fact, they will tell you, and I would understand it, saying, I didn't do anything. All I did was click that, you know, all I did was push that uh, that nasty thing forward. Hey, I didn't do anything. So they don't feel responsible, and, you know, maybe they shouldn't, but maybe people should think a little more that unless unless of course you're also i guess you know have people getting that crack hit from the outrage you know that they they want to be around it they they feel good and strong when they're in a big band um thinking they're making the world a better place by hating someone i i, I think this is just a terrible way to live to operate on you know crack hits of hate but you know, people are doing it um but I think that, well, as terrifying as it is, and it is kind of scary when it's happening, um, you do go on. I mean, hopefully you do. Hopefully, you know, it doesn't get so um, so bad that, um, Jen, someone is ringing my doorbell. Uh, so you're going to ask me a question and I'm going to be listening to you while I'm seeing what's going on over there. Now is a good time as any to go ahead and kind of pivot to the next thing I want to talk about, which is over this last kind of dust up over cancel culture. I saw a lot of people conflating cancel culture with just critiquing people like and basically trying to dismiss the idea of cancel culture by saying, oh, it's just it's just critique and you don't want to be critiqued. And it's like, no, cancel culture is a little deeper than that. And I do think there is a definite difference between trying to cancel someone and just trying to legitimately critique somebody. And I'm not super comfortable with those two things being lumped together because I think it diminishes cancel culture and it also takes critique and moves it into a place where it would almost be like you can't do critiques anymore because it gets conflated with cancel culture. And I do think there is still a legitimate place for critique online. Like you, there's still sometimes when people say things or do things, there is a valid way of saying you're wrong or I disagree with you without it becoming this huge thing where you like scalp somebody and like paraded around Times Square. Oh, well, of course. I mean, we're here to disagree with each other and learn from each other. And, and you, it's interesting that you say that you think it's deeper than that because I think the motivations maybe are deeper than that, or maybe they're juvenile or maybe they're both, but it, but in terms of saying that, well, you know, it's not really cancel culture, it's just critiquing. This is just incredibly shallow because that's not what it is. Because if it were critiquing, you would want to have a conversation about it. And that's not what happens. I mean, anytime you, you know, you try to raise your hand and say, hi, I actually like to state my point of view. It's like, no, you don't have the right to do that. And actually, I was listening to a great podcast that people should check out called the Manifesto podcast. And it's with, um, it's with Jake Siegel. He's an editor at Tablet, and I wrote my Portlandization piece for him and Phil Clay are the hosts. And they had Thomas Chatterton Williams on. And it was just a great 
brilliant, brilliant episode. These guys are so brilliant. I don't understand what they're talking about half the time, but I listen to it anyway. But they were talking about, um, so uh, uh, Chatterton Williams has a new book out, uh, Self-Portrait in Black and White. And they were referring to some review. I don't know who wrote it. I didn't catch or they didn't say that it was like a really like pissy um bad review of the book just saying how bad it was and 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 he was he was citing the reason the reviewer was that he was right because he he wasn't actually talking about the book what he did was he trotted out a bunch of names of people like barry weiss and he he lumped that all in there and now it's like aha oh well now i know what this i don't like barry weiss so erg by the way i love barry weiss just let me preface that by saying that but you're not actually talking about the work you're just signaling you're part of this tribe that person is part of the other tribe ergo he's a bad person and his writing is bad but he actually didn't didn't critique the book and that that is not that is not someone that should be writing a book review just like we had um what was the movie review for the joker in the new yorker Mm -hmm. the other day it's like it's all about it's all politics like well you know what the filmmaker was really trying to say it's like no how do you know that are you in the filmmaker's head or do you just feel like we need to talk about the central park five again right now so you know criticism is great we should have great and 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 controversial and and intelligent reviewing and critiquing Cancel culture has nothing to do with critiquing at all. It's it's a tactic. And I think it also necessitates that you don't think too deeply about it. Because if you did think deeply about it, you'd start to say, huh, I'd like to ask some questions here. I'd like to find out a little more. And I don't see people that are going on these rampages as wanting to find out a little more. Yeah, and I think another difference is between cancel culture and just doing regular critique is when you're critiquing something, it's not an emotional process. There's nothing visceral to it. You're not getting anything out of it. Whereas when you're trying to cancel somebody, it is very visceral and it's very vicious and it is very emotional. And so that's why I don't think conflating those two things is a good idea because they're two very different kind of mental processes, I think. Well, I think that you I think you can get emotional when you're critiquing something. I mean, you want to try to harness it a little bit so you're not bleeding all over the page or it's the mic. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that uh, these campaigns are all about emotion. They make you feel something. They make you feel like you're part of a larger group. They make you feel like you're working for a better future. They make they you you're you're getting rid of someone whose views you find um offensive or disgusting or dangerous. And it is all about feeling and you know there are people that we should say kind of terrible things about because they're doing kind of terrible things but we shouldn't do it by just by just roaring at them that's not the way that that's not a grown-up thing to do yeah and it's it's just i'm trying to figure out the best way to kind of put it it's like you can do critique and and going back to like the joker movie a lot of people were putting out pieces on the movie before the movie even launched. So it's like, okay, you're writing a piece about something that I'm going to go out on, on a limb and presume you haven't even seen yet. And so many of the reviews on the Joker focused more on what people thought of the movie or what they read into the movie versus just the movie. Like, okay, what is this movie about? And I've tried to kind of avoid a lot of those those articles because I haven't watched it yet and I don't want spoilers and nobody prefaces with spoiler alert anymore but it's just like you it's kind of the cancel culture is kind of like the opposite of critique in a way because you're not you're not meaningfully engaging in the content that you're talking about you're just kind of spewing feelings out there for whatever reason you're doing it whether it's you want to appeal to a certain crowd, you're trying to get the likes and the retweets, you're trying to get clout, you're trying to get attention, but it's not actually anything of decent substance. And I think that is really one of my problems with cancel culture. It's like, if you have something to say to somebody, fine. Okay. If you have substantial critique of something somebody did, fine. But if what you're doing is just like emotional diarrhea all over the internet, like what, 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 how, why do you want me to take you seriously? Like you're not you're not engaging with this seriously. So how am I supposed to take you seriously? Well, yeah. And I mean, we know this is the case. I mean, you have, you know, you've got certain people online who are, 
who have a lot of followers, like like a Roxanne Gay, right? And she sees something she doesn't like, and she you know points that way, and 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 thirty thousand people pile on this person that a minute ago they never heard of, and I know this from my own experience, having you know people report what I was doing to YouTube as a hate site or channel or something, in in saying, well, I didn't see it, I didn't watch it, but you know it's one way to make this shit go away. It's like, wait, what? Like that is, but you know, Jen, I've had a lot of time to think about this obviously and and people's motivations and and why they would do this and i think that i think that they just feel lonely and i think that they want to feel like they're part of something and they want to feel like they're they have allies and and this is a place that it's very easy to go i mean they're doing it online so obviously they're for the most part sitting alone in their room or at the coffee shop or wherever it is and I don't know. And yes, like I said, it's it's the little crack hit of outrage. And you can read all the studies that say people would, you know, they prefer that to, you know, something more substantial or nice. They they get more of a, an emotional zing from it. But really what's fueling it, it's just got to be that people are feeling lonely. I, I, I know, I know that there are people that are saying I'm doing it because I feel like I'm creating a better world by get, getting rid of the people that I don't like or that are now in this particular moment in the culture considered the bad people. But what's like underneath that nub? What's that motivation? And it just kind of makes me, frankly, kind of sad for them. I mean, I know I should be super angry, but I just am really not. I, I got to kind of feel like, like you take the mob as it is and yeah, you can be super angry at them and s- kind of almost hate the things that they're doing, but take the single person. I mean, I just start feeling sort of like tender and sad for this person and just want to sit with them and say, what's up? You know, what's up? Yeah, and I think there is definitely like a tribalistic aspect to it and people wanting to feel like they're part of a group. And it's also, I think there's a lot of kind of intellectual laziness that goes into it too, because you see this a lot, like even, especially, especially poor Jesse Singhal, who oh, gets beat up on a regular basis on Twitter. I don't know how he does it, but for some reason, well, I, I know why, but I don't understand why. He has gotten this label of being a transphobe. And whenever, <laughs> but, but whenever he actually like, calls somebody out and is like, okay, can you point to like a specific thing that I've written that you disagree with that we can talk about? The answer is inevitably something along the lines of, I don't have time to educate you or go figure it out for yourself or go Google it. Or there's no, because these people have not actually intellectually engaged with his work. Like you, you think this because somebody told you, blah, blah, blah. And so that you just accept it uncritically instead of actually going and doing the legwork and actually engaging in somebody's content. And I saw a lot with what happened to you too, is like people wanting to slam you for what you said, but having no idea what the hell it was you said because they never watched the freaking video. No, they didn't. And, and I, I, you know, I, again, I've had a lot of time to think about this and I, I can understand why some people got angry. Maybe not to the, not to the level yeah. of anger they showed me, but I mean, you know, I I operate in the world a certain kind of way. I just like I don't know. I I don't take offense at a lot of things that people take offense to. But I want to get back to Jesse for a second. Jesse is an unbelievably rigorous and vigorous thinker and researcher, and he is so able to back up, I mean, to the point where I get his newsletter, it's like, Jesse, how do you write 30 pages of research stuff every night? But he seems to. Um, You know, who's going to go debate him? They're not, they can't. They can't. I would love to hear someone that was as rigorous about uh, in these areas, but has an opposite point of view, actually sit and debate him. And I bet he'd love it. I mean, but you have to bring it. And no, it, that's too hard. It's too much work, right? It's easy to just say, no, you're wrong, or don't ask me, or you even asking the question just proves it. It proves that you're a homophobe or a transphobe or a misogynist or whatever. Just by asking a question, it's like, no, that's not what that proved. It proved that I asked a question because I wanted to hear why you think the way you do. I mean, this is 
this is the way we're supposed to operate in the world and, and make progress, not by just shutting down large swaths of the population because we think we should be afraid of them, right? So, yeah, he's a good example. Katie Herzog is another another person I adore. And, you know, she gets slammed regularly and she just comes out every day and keeps writing. And, and when there's, you know, when there's posters on the uh, uh, the news boxes of The Stranger, you know, saying Katie Herzog is a transfer, blah, blah, blah. She takes a picture of it. She puts it on her social media and let's go and let's tell the next story. Like, we're not going to, this is just juvenile. If you want to have a real conversation with me, then let's do it. This other stuff, we're just going to move on or laugh about it so yeah and i laugh when she posts up the the pictures of the stickers because i'm like somebody actually paid money to make these stickers and post them places it's like what is wrong with you and and they they both both her and jesse's i guess original sin for these people and i'll kind of break fourth wall for a second to explain to people who don't understand how this whole thing started for jesse um, about a year ago, he wrote a piece for The Atlantic, and it's a really good, like, seriously solid, deep dive. I don't even know how many words. It's a lot of words. It's a lot the, of words. It, it's it's got to be over 10,000. Like, it's a long piece. And he's talking about teenagers transitioning from doing gender transition. And apparently, his great sin is that in this piece... And he's not placing a value judgment on any of these decisions, but just in the service of creating this piece on teenagers transitioning, he points out that there are teenagers who did transition and then later regretted it and wished to go back to their birth gender. Not putting like a value judgment on it, but just saying, hey, this is a thing that happens too. And yeah, that's it. And so for that, he got labeled as a transphobe and to this day gets harassed on a daily basis on the Twitter machine. So just to let everybody know who didn't know the story, that's the story. And go read his piece in The Atlantic. It's actually a really good piece. But And if I can add, um, it was, you know, Katie did the same thing for The Stranger about a year and a half ago, I think it was the end of 2017, talking about kids who detransitioned, who, you know, had transitioned to uh, the sex that was they were not born with and then decided to go back. And this is just like, this is what we're supposed to do as journalists. We are supposed to write stories that are sometimes painful, that are fascinating, that can be controversial. Like, that's our job. And for that, she is just like Jesse, she is just persecuted. And it's like, Look, you don't, fine, you have a different view on that, that's fine. Or you you transitioned and you're super happy with it, that's fine. But other people aren't. And to deny, A, that that's the case, which how can you deny it it exists, or B, that somehow we're not supposed to pay attention to it because then that's against trans people, it's just, it's lunacy. It's lunacy. And we are, you, they're doing their jobs. They're doing their jobs. Yeah, and I can't believe that that is a controversial thing. And I kind of feel bad, especially since this if this is the reaction that either teenagers or early adults or whoever transition and then wish to transition back, if this is what reporting on it gets, I can't imagine what life has got to be like for those people. Like, how lonely and scary must that be? Because there's there's no support group for you. Like, you can't even discuss the fact that these people exist. Well, you know, obviously it's a it's a very tender topic and it's got, you know, people for, for, for a very long time. It's been, you know, it's con- controversial and lonely and now they're sort of being able to walk more in the sunshine and getting more rights and it's just, it's a good thing all around when trans people do not have to feel so persecuted. But then why would you turn around and persecute someone that decides that that was not the right thing for them? Right. It doesn't it and it doesn't make any sense. Um, live and let live. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish everybody could get there eventually. Hopefully, maybe <laughs> if we all just, just try real hard to be normal people and understand that other people are people, too. But to kind of bring this back to the idea of cancel culture, um, the case lately that really, really bothered me was the, the Carson King case, the one of the, the kid who was on college game day and he had his little beer mm-hmm. sign. And then it went mm-hmm. viral and he ended up raising like over a million dollars for the University of Iowa's Children's Hospital. And then for some godforsaken reason, this idiot for the Des Moines Register felt the need to go take this kid down. 
And I'm just like, what the fuck? Why? Why? That, that, this is what bothers me. And I think this one was just a perfect encapsulation of what cancel culture has become. Because, of course, the, the reporter, whose name is Aaron Calvin, I remember it now, he ended up getting canceled because, of course, he went back into Carson King's Twitter feed to find controversial topics or controversial tweets to put up. And so people did the same thing to him. And it's, I can almost understand it, but I'm still not super cool with the, the perpetrating of, of the circle of canceling. But it's just like, people just want to tear people down now for some reason. Like, even like people that did a good thing. Like, why? Why? Who approved this story? Who thought this was a good idea? Yeah, well, exactly. I've been a journalist since 1993. And... Uh, you know, obviously we didn't have the Twitter machine back then. And you do do your research on people when you're writing about people and you try to make it interesting and you try to like bring things in that the other guy won't. Um, and yeah, okay, we live in an age now where it's just let's go back and read everybody's tweets. But as a journalist, it would never ever have occurred to me to go back like eight years and look at this guy's tweets from when he was 16. First of all, this just bizarre, but maybe shows you that the person who did the article, I don't know how old he was, I don't know how much experience he has, but it was not very creative. And it certainly was not necessary to the story that was happening now. Um, but he did it. And then, yeah, his editors decided to run it, which is really, really weird. I mean, if you had gone back and found out that the guy was like secretly in the KKK and he went every Sunday night to meetings like now, okay, then I'd say, all right, you know, this is kind of weird. Like he's doing this great thing for kids, but he's also in the KKK. So I don't know. This is kind of a problem. We do have to say something. I would, I would say, yes, you have to say something. This is not that at all. It was a poor decision on the part of the writer and it was a poor decision i mean if i were an editor and they came to me with that i'd be like what the fuck why are we doing what what but then it's out there and then it's like oh but i didn't say it and then then someone catches me not mentioning the fact that he had this thing from eight years ago then i look like i'm hiding something because i knew it's a mess it, it, it's a mess it was just it was just poor altogether and then he got fired right the, the, yeah, the journalist yeah, got they fired. Ultimately right. fire him. Right. And then the Des Moines Register, is that what it was? Is that the paper yeah. that it was in? They have to do like some big soul searching and Brent breast renting and coming out and saying, you know, we don't know. And maybe, I mean, it's just, it's just bad journalism. It's just bad journalism. Write a better story. That's, that's my answer to that. Yeah. And I always feel like I'm so old school every time I say this, but I'm just like, where are the editors? Where are the editors well, on all of well, these pieces? <laughs> Well, that's interesting you say that because, you know, it, it it usually is the case, and I'm going to assume it is the case at the Des Moines Register, that there are editors still, but there are a lot fewer editors than there used to be. And I'm sure there are, you know, well, obviously, we, you know, we I put things on Medium. I don't have an editor there. Um, but, you know, who knows how much editorial, uh, how much an editor had his or her fingers in it. I don't know. That would be interesting. Yeah, there's, I mean, and you can self-publish so long as you can self-edit, but being able to self-edit is an art that a lot of young people don't have. So you kind of got to have somebody there to put the guardrails and be like, yeah, this piece, no, uh-uh, we're, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, honey, no. <laughs> oh, so but, I haven't seen the Joker either, but I want to see the Joker because someone, Nick Gillespie, was telling me that it's like uh, late 1970s New York when I was, of course, living here. And I I want to see it. I'd like to go back there for a little while. And I think you told me, Jen, mm -hmm. that you really you really want to be in New York in the 1970s, but but you just can't do it. Yeah, I was I was born a little too late for that, but. <laughs> But yeah, I want to see it. Like, and I actually, before this whole controversy blew up, I was kind of like against the movie just because I wasn't super cool with the idea of actually giving the Joker a backstory. I kind of wanted things to just kind of be as they were, where you kind of didn't really know how the mm -hmm. Joker became the Joker. But now that all this is blown up, it's like, well, now I have to go fucking watch the movie. So yeah, can't can't stop people from creating. Yeah. And it <laughs> <laughs> and especially since I'm already having offers from people who want to discuss it on the podcast. And I'm like, I have to go see the movie oh, first. Yeah, I haven't seen it either, but I yeah. will. I will. 
But a topic to do a, a very hard pivot here. Um, a, a thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially when it comes to cancel culture, is this idea of handling things publicly versus handling things privately. And I get that, I mean, every time you post on social media, it is performative in some way, shape, or form. But I question a lot of times, especially for people who do stuff like this, who do actually have an avenue to address things privately with somebody versus addressing things publicly with them, how outraged are you really? Because I would think that if you genuinely had a problem with something, you would talk to the person in question instead of making it this very large, loud thing on the internet so that you can get attention be for not liking the thing. And I, I think a way that social media has kind of ruined people in a way is that there's this, like, almost this urge to have everything, like, every thought that goes through your head be public. And it's like, no, you can handle some of this stuff privately if you really want to. And I see that happening less and less. And that's really, I, I think that's really bothersome. And I don't think it's fair to the victims because if you don't give somebody a chance to handle something privately, then, I mean, you're kind of forcing them into a corner that, maybe that isn't entirely a fair thing to do to that person. You know, I don't know how much of it has to do with the fact that we live so much of our um, lives online now. So, you know, I, I can't say that people have fewer um, social skills, <laughs> like having conversations, like with the, uh, with the guy at the grocery store, because, you know, kids still go to school and they still, though I guess some are going to school online now. Um, but, you know, being able to go up to someone, and, and we know this in our own lives, and say, you know what, I'm mad at you, or I have a problem with that, or I feel jealous, or I feel sad, that's hard. You know, that, that's hard to do. Um, even, you know, in our personal lives, maybe even in our marriages. Um, so if you feel you have a problem with somebody and maybe you feel that there's like an imbalance, I mean, we hear this all the time now, I felt there was an imbalance of power, so I didn't feel like I could say anything. I, yeah, I, I don't really understand that, but I get that people do feel that way. Um, they just don't feel courageous enough to challenge someone. That's the that's sort of like the kind version of it, I would say. And then another part of it is, you know, I'm going to have allies here um, if I do this publicly. I'm going to not feel so afraid. And then I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get kudos or maybe it's going to help me develop my identity or I want to be a figurehead. And I'm going to be a figurehead by positioning myself this very important thing in the culture. And now I am standing against it or I'm standing for it. And um, if, if I have to do that by calling someone out on what I feel is the poor behavior that I'm going to do it. You know, they do it for a lot of reasons. I, again, I think it, 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 the genesis of it though, is not this big thought out political plan. It, it stems from a sort of impulse of, of, of feeling alone and not having maybe the courage to confront someone. Um, Though there are also people, um, I think that probably are pretty strategic. It's like, okay, I don't like that person. I don't like that person. She took my boyfriend or I didn't like her food at her restaurant and I don't like her. So I'm going to do this publicly now and I'm going to feel, you know, strong and I'm going to see her suffer. Because I think, I, I hate to say this, but I think, you know, I think people do get pleasure in seeing other people suffer. God, it, it literally almost brings tears to my eyes to say that. Uh, I, I just... It's just just such a terrible thing to to take pleasure in the in the suffering of others. Um, but yeah, we are we are kind of there. And 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 I'll just go back a little bit to what happened to me. You know, I, the girl that that kind of launched this. I've known her for five years. I mean, maybe even longer. She certainly could have come to me. I mean, like I'm like, I used to see her all the time, and told me what she thought. And I actually would have liked to have had that conversation because maybe it would have been elucidating. Maybe I could have understood more. And I have really tried to understand more about you know why people were so upset. I would have loved her. I would have bought the drinks. Um, but she didn't. And then I, you know, I, I made an overture to her and to others to come and, and talk about it, um, whether on the show or just privately. And nobody did. 
nobody would but that's this is normal you learn this when you you know you you become sort of <laughs> there's a whole cult of the canceled and we all know each other you know <laughs> and then we talk and go and have drinks and lunch and laugh and do things and every 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 single person says the same thing like no one would come to me directly nobody would they won't it's just it you know we're talking about maybe building something more relationships learning something understanding something it's a lot harder to do that than it is to just tear shit down right it's it's easy to demo a house it's not so easy to build a house so um you're not going to have people coming in actually wanting to have the conversation which is really a shame because i really truly would like to um and and we'll continue to do that i do that in my work i will do that in future podcasts i would love to have conversations with people i disagree with um so yeah bring it <laughs> Yeah, and I think another reason people don't want to do it, and this is also something that I've noticed in lots of other different areas, and it really does bother me, is that the the kind of dehumanization of people, like when you're attacking somebody on the internet, you don't really have to grapple with the fact that that's a human being. Like there's a person no. on the other end of all of that who is being mentally affected, emotionally affected, maybe even physically affected, their lives are being affected. And that it's just it's the dehumanization really bothers me. And obviously, if you want to meet someone face to face, you can't dehumanize them because they're right there in front of you. Like there's a human being right. and you have to talk to them to their face. So I think that's another aspect of why people don't accept those invitations, because to do that would mean you would have to actually face the person who you hurt and, and maybe have to answer for it. You know, I always think this, like, you know, like when you're younger and someone like doesn't return your email or your phone call and you're like, oh my God, what did I do? Or this person's so horrible. But you really have to think like, you don't know what's going on in their lives. You don't know if their mom just died or if they're having financial troubles or they're having health issues. And um, that to, to, to go on these destructive paths, you really are destroying people's lives in some ways. And I've, I've seen this firsthand and I've obviously read about it and I've written about it. And, you know, you really wouldn't want it done to you because you have problems too. And you have a mom that's sick too. And, you know, you have financial problems too. It's just, it's just not an okay way to operate. And, and I've already written and you know about what was going on in my household when this all happened. But, you know, we had someone dying in the house. Like it was, we really didn't need this added um, situation. But you know what? We all sort of just hung in and got through it. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. And there have been people that have committed suicide over this yeah. kind of stuff. And it's yeah. like, you, there's, there's also, you got to kind of remember that not everybody is in the same place mentally as you may happen to be. And things that maybe if it was done to you, you would feel differently, but it's, there, there's a human on the other end of this and you really don't know where they're at mentally. So when you go and attack somebody or you, you call them names or you, you do this, you, you put these labels on them, you may be setting something into motion that you didn't intend to do, but you did it anyway. God, and that's, that's, that, just, that, oh, that, I don't, I don't understand how people can do that. That's super fascinating, Jen. Wow. I, I've thought that, um, you know, you, you, you know, it's like you tell a little lie and then, or you, you just like set a little fire and it burns down the whole city and you, you didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, God, that, that's interesting. I would love to talk to someone, journalist hat <laughs> goes on. I would love to talk to someone that like started a campaign, um, but didn't realize what was actually going to happen. I mean, you know, but again, then I go back to the thing like there have been people. Yeah, there have been people that have committed suicide. There have been people that have been shunned not only by the people, you know, that were sort of canceling them, but by their own tribe, so to speak, because now they don't feel trusted. And that's, you know, that's online forever and no matter where they go for the rest of their lives. So, yeah, they can't be journalists anymore. They've got to figure out maybe they're going to be a nurse or or do something somewhere. They're, they're going to have a completely different life. But imagine to start one of these campaigns and then the person like suffers greatly or commits suicide or like, God forbid. Oh God. Um, uh, again, it's like the people that pushed that campaign forward are not going to feel guilty about that because they didn't do anything. They hit a button, right? 
But what about the person that started the campaign? I wonder how he or she would feel. And and I wonder if there would be the easy out of like, well, they just brought it upon themselves. You know, he was a, you know, he, he was a misogynist. And so it's not my fault, his fault. Oh, what a horror. Oh, what a horrible thing. Yeah, to I, be in that position, to, to know that you had done this to someone, but you didn't mean to. Think, people. Think. <laughs> God. Yeah, you, you, get, you gotta think before you do things, because you, like you, said, you you can start something, and you don't know where it's gonna end. And I was, I was also thinking about when I was talking to Matt the other day about his District 15 issues, about the poor Scandinavian father who is actually leaving the neighborhood because of how he was yes. treated during those meetings. And it's like, I'm, I'm sure the people who said what they said to him didn't mean it to end like that. But I mean, they made this dude feel so uncomfortable, so like unwelcome and attacked that he's just leaving. Like he's uprooting his whole life. And that's why it's like, like you, you can say these things and you can do it cavalierly, but you can't control how somebody's going to take that. And, a lot of people aren't kind of aren't in the same place that you and I are in where you're something of a public figure and you're used to just kind of like brushing stuff off like this shit really hurts people like badly. Well, cause and effect and it changes people's lives. But you know what? Maybe maybe he has this incredible new life wherever he's he's going and then they look back on it and they say, wow, geez, I mean, though it was terrible and I hated what they did. Now we're here in you know, Spring Valley or wherever it is that he's moving. And uh, they, you know, your life changes. Things impact your life. And this is this is one. Uh, yeah, that, that whole District 15 thing is, though I did sit with a friend of mine the other day who was visiting in Portland and he has a daughter, though the daughter's in private school because the mother wants that. Um, he was like, I don't think it's so bad. Hey, I was taking, I grew up in Boston. I was taking two trains to school. Like, hey, I dug it. I liked getting on the train. So, you know, a lot of points of view, but I completely disagree. First of all, I think it's so cockamamie the way they're doing it and really, really awful uh, to to be doing it in the way they're doing it on the grounds that they say are important to do. It's it's all it's all a complete mess. And the fact that they hired this guy after he destroyed the San Francisco stool system, it's like, what? Wh what? So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, and another wrinkle to that story that I didn't think about when I was talking to Matt, but I thought about it afterwards. It's like, okay, in in 2019, um, you can't really put your babies on the public transportation anymore because you'll get child services called on your ass. So. That's that's very that's a very interesting point. Well, you know, I don't know though. In New York City, we were all. I don't know if it's still the case. We were all. I actually I was riding the train to ten, no problem, and I saw a kid on the train. Two days ago, he was nine or ten. He was by himself. And, you know, hey, it's New York. <laughs> I, mean, I I hope and I and I understand parents who don't want to do that, especially like tender age children. I like the, the oh yeah, like having I mean, your nine year old kind of doing the subway thing by themselves. Like I, I don't know if I'd be super comfortable with it, but but wasn't it no, did, but when when Lenore Skenazy did it? Didn't she do it in New York? And that's what started uh -huh. the whole. That's uh -huh. what started this whole thing. Is she put her nine year old alone on a train in New York and the everything blew up worst mother in america uh you know i was i was saying this to someone the other day i don't know where it was i mean <laughs> my mother once said to me i think i was uh i think i was 13 or 14 and my brother was 12 and she's like okay i'm going down i'm going down to the bahamas for five days and there's chef boyardee in the in the um pantry and i'll see you i was like bye it's like it was a different era <laughs> yeah you can't do that now no people don't do that now well maybe people do i don't know Oh, I mean, they, they they probably do, but if you get caught, I mean, then you're you're kind of screwed because you're probably gonna get arrested and charged with child abuse because you left your child all by themselves for, I don't know, an hour or two. But yeah, that's just that's just a whole super weird situation. That that's a whole other thing that I can unpack is the whole parenting thing and stuff that's going on right now. Like, I don't, I re I really don't know how you're supposed to be a parent anymore, but. Anyway, kind of kind of beyond the scope of our conversation for today, but I'm trying to think, is there is there anything else, any other points you want to make, anything else you want to address? You know, if people are going to engage in these these sorts of campaigns, um, they should really, I would think, ask themselves why. 
Um, what's the real motivation behind what you're doing? Um, is it because you want to be a figurehead? Um, you want people to look up to you? Is it because you're lonely? Is it because you have a... Um, you have a gripe with that person personally? Is it because you think that um, you're helping to usher in a better future? Really, I would really think about before you're spreading, you know, hate and becoming more of the sort of hate noise pool, just think about it. Um, because there's so many other things to do. <laughs> you know, go read a book, take a bath, take a walk, um, try to try to engage in a way that's um, really intellectually curious I mean, because that's what we need more of. I mean, I know like I'm sounding like, let's tie this all up with a bow, but I, I really do feel that way. And I have to say, um, since all this happened, I do, I, I don't think I ever engaged in a, in a pylon. I hope I didn't. Um, but now for sure, I, I just wouldn't. And if I have criticism, I'm going to couch it in a way that I can um, back it up. And if I'm wrong, then I will back down um, because I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We're all wrong. We're all wrong all the time. Um, so I guess then just be kinder. <laughs> I, I think that's at least a nice, positive, uplifting note to end this on. So <laughs> at this point, this is the point where obviously you know what to do. Go ahead and plug yourself and your stuff and tell people where to find you. Oh, sure. I am. Uh, you can go to follow me at Twitter at Nancy Rom, N-A-N-C-Y-R-O-M-M. -M. Uh, my website's the same, nancyrom.com. I have a book that came out last year called To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder, which has been selling really well. And I would love for you to buy it. And I would love for you then to email me or uh, contact me on Twitter and we can talk about it. And I am here in New York. Um, uh, trying to start a new media company so we can keep an eye on that too jen we'll come back and talk about it oh do we have we have breaking news now too no that just that just a little tiny taste we'll just that's all we're gonna say for now okay how's that okay all right. fair enough fair enough we <laughs> okay can, we can talk off mic <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me back oh thanks you thank you for sitting down with me nancy you know i always love talking to you yep me too so that was my conversation with Nancy. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it. I always do love talking to Nancy. So obviously, if you have not checked it out yet, um, check out Nancy's book. It's called To the Bridge. It is a really great book. It's one of those that's almost like stranger than fiction kind of things, but it is an actual true story. So I highly suggest checking that out. You can get it on Amazon. And so as always, if you made it this far, thank you for listening. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Libertarian Institute, and on my Patreon page at Jen Monroe. Or again, I will have the links in the show notes. Take care and until next time.